Have a warm welcome on behalf of uh, the <laughs> William H. Miller III Department of Physics and Astronomy. Um, it's just a fantastic opportunity here to celebrate Paul's life and legacy. And it's astonishing to me when I look out and see how many family members, friends, and colleagues are here, including many people online as well. So we're going to hear a lot about Paul from uh, people who know him very well, different aspects of his career and personality. So I'm gonna keep my remarks relatively brief, but I wanted to speak from the perspective of department chair, something I share with Paul, um, and also as a member of the department for over 33 years. So back in the day, um, this department was a physics department 
but inside this physics department was a group of outstanding, a small but outstanding group of right. faculty members, including Paul, who were pioneering in the area of ultraviolet observations from space. This was you know, a real jewel, um, and this was recognized in what was you know, a very transformational part of the history of the department when NASA, on the basis of this strong expertise in ultraviolet astronomy, selected Hopkins against all the odds to host the Space Telescope Science Institute. So Paul was a big reason why we're where we are today with you know, one of the world's centers of astronomy. I think you know, Paul's particular contribution to the department in terms of research was his leadership of the sounding rocket program. This is something we'll hear more about um, in the program to come, but this is a really unique resource. Hopkins is one of the few departments in the country who has a sounding rocket program, something that offers uh, faculty, postdocs, students to get involved in pioneering development of instrumentation that may someday fly on large telescopes launched by NASA. So it's technology development, it's pushing the envelope, and it's something that can involve graduate students or postdocs on a you know, time scale of years, you can do something big. And that's, a, that's something that we wouldn't have without Paul. So um, from my personal perspective, uh, when Paul was the chair, this was back in the late 90s, the early 2000s, I was um, charged by the department to represent us on what's called the ARC Board of Governors. This was the nonprofit that was overseeing the construction of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And so fact, I don't oh want to be. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, so I was, yeah, I was, you know, not only involved in this, but I was actually the chair of this board. And this was a period, today the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was an enormous success. It rivals the Hubble Space Telescope as the most productive telescope made in the 21st century. So today it's wonderful, but back then we were in incredibly difficult circumstances. And as the chair of the board, I was sort of in the crosshairs. We were way behind schedule, way over budget, and we didn't know what to do. And we eventually came to a solution, but I wanted to really, you know, in retrospect, thank Paul. Paul was the chair at that time, and he was someone I could go to. Paul, as you know, was always very calm. He didn't tend to get too agitated about things. And so his wisdom and patience and, you know, his advice to me and support really meant a lot at that time. So I'm going to turn the program over to others, but in closing, I just wanted to say what you, know, you all know, that Paul was really one of a kind. He touched many people's lives um, and improved many people's lives, and he's going to be very sorely missed. Thank you. Okay, I'll try and speak into this. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and I'm gonna read my comments because I'm a little worried that I won't say what I need to say uh, if I don't read them. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Marion, I'm Paul's younger daughter. I also happen to be a faculty member at Johns Hopkins like my father was for over 50 years, though I only came here in 2013. So I'm especially touched and honored to be able to welcome so many family and friends to a place that was a second home to my dad, the physics and astronomy department at the Johns Hopkins University. Academics can be an odd lot driven by a desire for knowledge, often of an extremely esoteric sort. I know this pretty well because I study the ancient cultures of the Middle East. Um, and dad really exemplified this academic ideal, being wholly engaged in his scientific pursuits to the very end of his life. There was never a time that I can remember when dad was not doing science. An academic never really retires. They just get to do less administrative work. Paul was the son of Jewish immigrants fleeing Eastern Europe, what is today Western Ukraine in the 1930s and who settled in New York City along with 
uh, an extensive network of aunts, uncles, and cousins who remain exceptionally close today, and many of whom are here with us. His parents, Mara and Lazar, expected him to go into a practical career like engineering, which is what he started out in as a 16-year-old freshman at Columbia University. But he tells a story about how, even as a kid, he loved astronomy, making hand-drawn sky charts as a member of the Junior Astronomy Club at the Hayden Planetarium. So he transferred into the physics major, which was his gateway to astronomy. Not long after receiving his PhD in 1964, he met my mom at a party. From stories when we were little, this party took on a mythical quality. Neither mom nor dad knew the host or were even sure if they had been invited. They were from completely different backgrounds. He, the son of Jewish immigrants, mom, the daughter of a Park Avenue psychiatrist who was raised in the waspy suburbs of Westchester. But they had that something special that made them perfect for one another, becoming each other's best friend and soulmate for over 56 years of married life. After marrying in 1965, they moved to Washington, D.C., where dad was a research fellow at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory and mom taught in the D.C. public schools. My older sister, Catherine, was born there in 1966, while the cherry trees around the tidal basins blossomed. From the Naval Laboratory, dad took a job as an assistant professor at Hopkins in what I believe was then known only as the Department of Physics. And in 1968, just after the riots, he, mom, and Kathy moved to 1317 Park Avenue, a three-story red brick row house in Bolton Hill. I was born in 1969 in the midst of a late May Baltimore-style heat wave. We could maybe use a little bit of that right now. I spent my childhood playing in the streets of Bolton Hill. Paul and Joan lived there at 1317 Park Avenue until 2019 and on the Johns Hopkins Homewood campus. That was when dad's office was in the corner room of Roland Hall, looking into the lower quad. I think it's called Wyman Quad. And when the land where Mason Hall is today, next to the Baltimore Museum of Art, was an empty grassy field where dad would take us to shoot off model rockets that we built. I remember when dad received tenure, I was seven years old, and my parents had a party at our house before we left for a year sabbatical in Paris. I didn't really understand what tenure meant. Someone explained to me that it meant my dad could stay in his job longer. To my ears, it sounded like 10 years, and I knew it must be a really good thing since we were having a big party for it. So I assumed it meant he could keep his job for another 10 years which to a seven-year-old is pretty much the same thing as a lifetime. It was a special childhood, and Kathy and I grew up with the physics and astronomy community as part of our family, at holiday parties, department picnics at the Evergreen House, and gatherings to watch eclipses. Bill Fasty, Daryl Strobel, Warren Moose, Dick Henry, and so many others. My dad was an exceptional, and an exceptionally lucky person. He found his passions in life, astronomy, music, tennis, wine, travel, and was able to pursue them in partnership with a beloved wife, good friends, and supportive colleagues. He accomplished so much in his scientific career while enjoying life and his family and friends to the fullest. So on behalf of Joan, Kathy, and me, I want to say how glad we are that you can join us today to celebrate this wonderful man and his remarkable life. Okay, uh, we're going to st start a section on Paul's scientific legacy, and the first speaker is Bill Brun. Okay, uh, hope everyone can hear me well. 
Thanks to Stefan and Hal for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about Paul and my time with him. I would have been there, but yesterday I arrived in Pescara, Italy, where I'll spend the next five weeks as a visiting professor. Next weekend, we are going to Pisa, where I will spend some time with Stephen Shore at the University of Pisa. I believe that some of you might know him. He knew Paul and expresses his condolences and best wishes. I have no photos because, as well as I can remember, we took no photos. So I guess you'll just have to look at me. Paul was the best advisor and mentor. He taught me so much. In 1973, I accepted an offer for, for graduate school at Hopkins because I wanted to study Aurora using sounding rockets. The first week I was there, Paul was showing us first year students around the department. We were in room 30 of Rowan Hall, standing in front of a large cork board with, with papers pinned to it. Paul pointed at the papers on the Aurora work and said, here's our work on the Aurora. We're getting out of that now. And I said to myself, uh-oh, what am I going to do now? I decided to stay and learn everything I could, even though I'd be studying astrophysical objects, not Aurora. The first rocket I did with Paul was to get good ultraviolet spectra of Comet West. Paul and Peter Takex had tried to measure UV spectrum of Comet Kahutak a few years earlier, but got about five seconds of spectra before the solar glint uh, confused the quadrant tracker. So he told me to design a new sun shield for it, which I did. That's putting a lot of faith in a first year graduate student. But he looked at the design over and the shop made it. We went out to White Sands and prepared for the launch. I remember Paul uh, 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 driving me up into Oregon Mountain Pass, especially early in the morning, just before the launch, just to make sure that the comet was gonna be there. Um, I don't really have any memory in my interactions with him at that time, just that he was very easy to be around and introduced me to many new experiences. The next morning, the rocket went off, the tracker acquired the comet, and we got lots of great spectra. When it came time to analyze the data, Paul gave me some papers to read. He then took the 200 to 300 nanometer spectra and gave me the 120 to 200 nanometer spectra to analyze for the paper. I did it on my own, but under his watchful eye and a lot of help. He wrote the paper assigning me parts to write, but then improving my writing uh, just like he always did. So it was just Paul and me as authors, my first published science paper. I'm actually impressed that the paper is still being referenced pretty much every year since. A year later, we were preparing for two rocket launches, the first from White Sands to measure ultraviolet diffuse galactic background, a German group planned to make, do infrared measurements using an Ares rocket, which was 44 inches in diameter. They didn't care about the rotational orientation, so we took a short 15-inch diameter Araby sounding rocket section and put sideways in the Ares rocket. Dick Henry found some likely targets for us to observe, while the German group looked at their uh, infrared targets. The second was to perform ultraviolet hot spectra calibrations from Moomer, Australia. At the time, there was no really good calibrated spectra in the far ultraviolet. So we were gonna measure the spectra of five hot stars using three spectrometers on an Araby sounding rocket. We had the payload and we're almost at the point of integrating with, with NASA. That's when, as Marion said, Paul received, I believe, a Fulbright fellowship and spent a year in France. In those days, without any internet, when he was gone, he was gone but it was the best thing he could have done for me because it forced me to really focus and to learn to love lists. Of course, he didn't leave me without guidance. He left me in the very able and very large hands of Bill Faston. So I aligned all the spectrometers and telescope mirrors. I drove down to Goddard Space Flight Center for spin balance and, and vibration tests. I interacted with NASA personnel and logistics. And in the field, I made decisions and had to remember to plug in the battery for launch. In Australia, I also had George Mouth as my postdoc, who made sure I didn't make too many mistakes. George is still one of my best friends, even though we live a continent away from each other. Paul knew what he was doing leaving me like that. What I learned from him prepared me for that moment and has enabled me to lead my own research group through dozens of month-long field studies over the past 40 years. When Paul came back, he gave me room to do the analysis provided really useful guidance when I needed it. I have a very distinct image in my head of one late evening with just Paul and me outside of our adjacent offices, 
trying to solve some riddle of a quirk that we had just discovered in the data, and then working together with him to try to devise a solution. I used to knock off work about 11 p.m. several nights a week and go with some other graduate students to the grad club, which was in the basement of McCoy Hall. There we would drink a few beers and sometime have gripe sessions. All the other graduate students had complaints about their advisor. One even said he wanted to become a professor so he could ruin lives. But I was always quiet and had nothing to say. I liked Paul and couldn't come up with anything to gripe about. He was such a great advisor. My PhD defense was in June of 1978. Let's just say that my performance wasn't stellar. After it, I was waiting outside the conference room in the hallway of Rowan Hall when I heard an uproar of laughter coming from the room. Uh-oh, again, what was this? A few minutes later, Paul came out and congratulated me for passing. But in the very next sentence, he added, we'll never let another student who knows as little astrophysics as you do graduate. There were many things I really liked about Paul. First, he was great to talk to. He was straightforward, but in a collegial way. When we had a disagreement about something, he would listen. And if he decided I was right, which didn't happen very often, then he would change his mind and agree. That always impressed me about him because I can tell you many people can never admit they're wrong, especially to their students. That was a great lesson for me. Paul also gave me great advice, much of which I pass on to my own students. One of my favorites is, you should always leave a typo or two in your manuscript so the reviewers have something to do. A second one was, always try to write better than your advisor. With Paul, that was very difficult because he was an excellent writer. A third one needs a little context. I accepted a postdoc position at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts to study the role of chlorine in stratospheric ozone depletion. Before I left, his advice with me is, don't get Cambridgeitis. And what he meant by this was, don't get so comfortable in a really appealing environment like Harvard, which it is, that you will take any position at all to stay there. Well, I stayed there for three years as a postdoc and then another seven as a research associate. I heard that he was not very happy with me for failing to follow his advice. Cambridge was a great environment, but uh, I, I belatedly did heed his advice and make my own way and eventually settled at Penn State, joining the faculty and department of meteorology and studying atmospheric chemistry. About a decade ago, I was invited by Darren Waugh to come to Hopkins to give a seminar. I gave my seminar and afterwards Darren arranged for dinner. He invited Daryl Strobel, Paul, Joan, and maybe a few others. It was a wonderful evening and the last time I saw Paul. It was so much fun to talk to him again and to hear Joan's stories about him. I heard later from Darren that there were some questions from his department's administrative staff about the cost of the wine. Over the years, I have found that some of my fellow scientists are really big into academic genealogy. You know, tracing my advisor and his advisor and his advisor, et cetera, back to Albert Einstein or Isaac Newton or whoever. I'm not a big fan of this. Emerging scientists should acknowledge their mentors, but make their own way in waves. However, there's a different kind of tracing I think is important. Paul did have a profound effect on me and how I conduct myself as a scientist and a professor. Thus, he has also had an effect on my students and now their students. This is the best kind of tracing. Paul's treatment of me inspiring me to treat my students and them to treat their students the same inspirational and human way. Paul's thoughtfulness, brilliance, and his humanity live on, not in just me and my students, but also in many others whose lives he's touched. I wish the best for Joan and their two daughters, Marion and Kathy, whom I heard much about, but think never met. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill, that was wonderful. Okay, we'll go back to our regular program here. Let me do this. Oh. 
Okay, everybody, I'm Hal Weaver, one of Paul's PhD students, and I'd like to share with you some uh, highlights, just a few highlights from Paul's career as a cometary researcher. Paul was a pioneer in the study of comets, a trailblazer who used ultraviolet spectroscopy to systematically investi investigate the composition of comets for almost 50 years. Now, I originally thought that showing a figure like you see down here in the lower left was way too technical and you know, for this venue, but it's the creation and analysis of data like this that was Paul's passion, his scientific bread and butter, his wheelhouse, what he did for his entire career and what he's mainly known for. And it looks great to me. <laughs> so I couldn't resist showing it. But I'll spare you and won't say anything more about this particular spectrum of comet Yakutaki taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, but Paul did this throughout his entire career. And instead, I'll just show a few pretty pictures and say in words some of his contributions to cometary science. And to the left here, we have Comet West, the one that Bill Bruhn just told you about. It was a spectacular comet in 1976. And off to the right is another so-called great comet, Comet Hale-Bopp, which uh, was in the mid-1990s. Now, these comets are called great comets because you can see them with your naked eye. In fact, I remember very distinctly driving down the Jones Falls Expressway and looking up and seeing Comet Hale-Bopp which is amazing, and even from the mall in Washington, D.C. So along with Bill Bruhn, though, as Bill was just explaining, they took a, a sounding rocket spectrum of Comet West. And by the way, almost everything that Paul did had to be from above the Earth's atmosphere because the Earth's atmosphere absorbs ultraviolet light, so you have to be in space in order to make these kinds of observations. But in this particular experiment that he did with Bill Bruhn, they discovered carbon monoxide in the coma of Comet West. And this discovery is one of Paul's most important scientific legacies. We study comets mainly because of what they can reveal about the conditions in the early solar system. And it turns out that the abundance of carbon monoxide in comets is particularly important because producing and retaining carbon monoxide ice in cometary nuclei, the core of the comet, requires exceptionally cold temperatures below 400, minus 420 degrees Fahrenheit. So after discovering carbon monoxide in Comet West, he realized he had a pretty good thing and he continued doing this for the rest of his career following you know, trying to measure carbon monoxide in other comets. And he found that its abundance varied dramatically by up to a factor of 100 from comet to comet. We don't yet fully understand exactly the implications of these abundance variations, but we're pretty sure they're related to exactly where the, in the solar system, the nucleus of the comet formed 4.6 billion years ago, and then its thermal history since the time of its formation. Now in 1995, Paul and I used Hubble Space Telescope to take these images off to the right of Comet Hale-Bopp when it was still really far away from the sun. It was more as farther away from the sun than Jupiter at this time. And this is the whole camera field of view. And then you zoom in on the uh, inner region to see here. And this is where the nucleus is inside the coma here. And it had a, a jet and the comet nucleus was rotating, and so it produced like a, a, an Archimedes spiral in the, you know, in, the, in the images, and that's what you see, the spiraling uh, uh, coma, which was really neat. Now, the comet was on its way into the inner solar system, and that's when Paul, along with grad student Jason McFate and the next speaker, Steve McCandless, observed Hale-Bopp using a sounding rocket, producing one of the finest examples of a cometary ultraviolet spectrum ever obtained. And Steve is gonna tell you more about that uh, next. Now, 
Paul used a variety, he just used so many different space platforms to investigate comets. And we've already mentioned sounding rockets, and you see in the upper left here, a picture of one of them out at the White Sands Missile Range. And Paul, you see you know, from the back here. But in 1978, NASA launched the International Ultraviolet Explorer Satellite Observatory. And Paul got in on the ground floor and used IUE to observe about 50 different comets over the next 18 years, including the famous comet Halley in 1986. Now, IUE was in a geostationary orbit, meaning that it hovered over roughly the same place on Earth with an orbital period of about 24 hours. It was also particularly convenient that IUE was controlled for 16 hours a day uh, from the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. So Paul could simply drive down from Baltimore for as many IUE shifts. Now in 1990 was when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. And Paul was a very heavy user of Hubble for almost three decades. Most recently in December of 2019 and January of 2020, helping Dennis Bodowitz and John Noonan and several others measure the carbon monoxide abundance in the very first interstellar comet ever observed, called 2I Borisov, named after the uh, amateur astronomer Borisov. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the two Hopkins-led observatories in the lower left here, starting with the Hopkins Ultraviolet Telescope, called HUT, uh, which was led by Arthur Davidson, who unfortunately is no longer with us, a former member of this department, and it's shown here in the cargo bay of NASA's space shuttle. And then next to it is the far ultraviolet spectroscopic explorer led by our very own Warren Moose, who'll be speaking in a little, a little bit later. Now, Hutt's last measurements during the Astro-1 mission in 1990 were for Paul's observations of Comet Levy. And then Paul used FUSE to make the very first discovery of molecular hydrogen, this is the most abundant molecule in the universe, in a comet showing that it was produced primarily during the photodissociation of formaldehyde, which was a, an unexpected result. And then finally, in the lower right, Paul was a respected scientific voice on Rosetta, which was an audacious mission that orbited a comet for nearly two, for about two years and sent a probe down to the surface. You can see the, uh, the spacecraft here and the probe that went down to the surface of comet 67P Cherium of Garis Menko. Now, Rosetta was led by the European Space Agency with uh, NASA as a partner, and Paul thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to interact with international colleagues during meetings at a variety of wonderful European venues from the early 2000s through 2016. Okay, so I hope I provided a little flavor for Paul's main contributions to cometary science but I'd like to finish with a few personal reflections and photos. In the upper left, I found this photo in my, one of our paper albums, uh, showing Paul at the depart departmental reception following my PhD thesis here at Hopkins. It's Paul, and that's not me, by the way. That's one of Warren's former uh, postdocs. Paul was an inspirational advisor who introduced me to comets and I feel very fortunate that we were able to spend the next 40 years collaborating on a wide variety of cometary investigations. But the photo on the right shows that it wasn't all work. While Paul was a firm believer in working hard, he also knew the value of having fun. And here is Paul and me with our good colleague, Michelle Festu, and collaborator on comets, who sadly passed away in 2005, hiking in the Grand Canyon. And then in the bottom left, uh, we had a wonderful medieval style dinner with the Rosetta team in Delft, Holland. So I'd like to end with a fond farewell. This is my wife, Debbie, and I got to see Paul in his new condo in December when he was still relatively bright and still brimming with enthusiasm for science. Unfortunately, his heart just wouldn't cooperate. We'll miss interacting with Paul, but we'll always cherish our memories of him. Thank you.
Oh, I must remember to eat the mic, right? Yes, eat, eating the mic um, and remembering to touch the buttons. And I have some cheat sheets here. Okay. So yeah, this, this picture is a little bit funny because um, Paul's drinking a beer and, I, and I'm drinking wine. And usually when we go out to dinner, it was the other way around. So I, I came here to work with Paul in uh, 1988 uh, on rockets. Let's see, where's the button? There we go. Um, he always liked this term, uh, sounding rockets as emissions in microcosm. Um, within the, the tenure of a, a graduate student, they could participate in all facets of, of the mission. Um, but the raison d'etre for for sounding rockets is always that we're going to do new science using new technologies and we're training the next generation of, of space scientists. Uh, there was a strong oral tradition with the graduate students. Um, it's like, sort of like shipbuilding. Um, you know, they just would learn from what the other person did beforehand. Uh, we always had a small team, usually uh, a junior student, a senior graduate student. Uh, the instrument scientists, I, I was hired to do that. And it was all anchored by, by Russ Pelton, uh, and before him, uh, a man named Chedister. And this was all fed and led by, by Paul as the PI. In his 55 year career at Johns Hopkins, Paul worked with over uh, 40 students in the sounding rocket program. Uh, and, and these were all varied uh, entrepreneurial experiments. But by that, I mean, uh, you'd write a proposal and suggest that this is something that could be done. Um, it will always have to be new, uh, where you would try to work out all the, the, the problems with it and, and make it all work. You tried to find the edge without going over it, and inevitably you would, and you'd try to get back when they did go over it. Um, so the, the, there's a process to, this, to, to these missions. Um, first thing you had to do is write a winning proposal. And then you would spend months in the lab procuring and assembling and testing and collaborate, uh, co calibrating the equipment. Then you would spend weeks at uh, either uh, Goddard Space Flight Center or later when I got here at, at Walsh Flight Facility in Virginia, you're away from your family and your friends. You're integrating the experiment with all these payload <coughs> uh, There's, you know, a telemetry, which is sort of the, the, the central nervous system of the rocket and it sends the data to the ground. There's the acquisition control system, which guides the experiment to target. And you had to align uh, with a star tracker to your TV camera, which we had on board the telescope. Um, there was thrust termination, just in case you started going off range and they would cut you down and separation and recovery systems. Of course, after you put it all together, you try to break it. You'd uh, do a pre-shake sequence test where you would run all the, the timers and get all the events set up. Then you'd shake it. And then, um, then you test it again as, as, after the shake test to see whether or not anything had broken. Um, then unfortunately, you would take the whole thing apart and you'd ship the thing off to White Sands Missile Range or maybe Fort Churchill. Uh, you put it all together again and you'd run more sequence tests, and then you would go to the rail. Um, Paul really hated this part about taking the, the, the payload apart. Um, and he loved the idea of ship and shoot. And, and this whole process, aside from writing the winning proposal, um, was something that he hired me to do because he really didn't like to be involved <laughs> with all this horror. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit now, just to give you a taste, of, um, uh, of, of, of what a sounding rocket mission is like. Um, he loved planning for, for these Comet missions. Uh, he had did Comet West and then this uh, Hal Bopp came through. It was a wonderful time in the 1996 uh, era, 97, uh, with, with Hayao Kataki, I get that right, and, and Hal Bopp showing up. Um, and sounding rockets were, were uh, essential for seeing the comet when it was near perihelion, the closest approach to the sun, when the comet was within, uh, say, about 25 degrees away from the sun. You couldn't see, you couldn't ever bring the Hubble Space Telescope to, to look at it in such instance uh, where it's being heated very violently by the sun 
because of uh, uh, the targeting constraints, you can't look any closer to the sun than about 50 degrees with Hubble. Um, so there was this beautiful comet that came, was coming through Hal Bob. Um, and it was on this very strange, uh, long roping trajectory out of the Oort cloud. Um, and it's got a period of something like 4,000 plus years. Um, here's a little trajectories of it. And, you know, we assembled uh, some students. Uh, we have a couple of whippersnappers, uh, Jason McFate and Eric Berg there, and then all uh, shepherded by Russ uh, as we went through. And this thing was going to be a monster. Um, this is the predicted uh, 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 brightness. Uh, it was predicted to get to minus one magnitude, which is about as bright as Venus. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you a video. Uh, the little taste of a five minute sounding rocket experiment. What you're going to see in here is going to start at T minus 20 seconds. There's a lot of anticipation and anxiety going on amongst the crew. Um, and they'll, they'll be the launch. There's a little blue screen afterwards, and someone will say, What was that? Uh, heightening our, our attention. Um, then I'm going to zoom forward to the, the TV camera, it goes on at 75 seconds. Uh, high voltage will go on at 90 seconds. That's where we begin to collect uh, spectra and we activate the detector. Um, we'll go to two guide stars. There's going to be guide star one and guide star two. And then we'll capture the comet at, at uh, 147. And there's going to be much excited spectral geeking out by, by Paul and, and students and, and team. Um, so let me just set the stage here. Okay. So this is uh, in the evening in, in April. Um, this is a picture of the comet. Uh, you can see the, the, the ion tail and the dust tail uh, at sunset over the Oregon mountain ridge. This is the view from White Sands from the missile range down the valley. Um, we've just completed our walk down uh, about eight o'clock um, showing our distinguished uh, visitors um, Michael Bloomberg and, and his entourage, which included uh, Arthur Davison and Frauke. Um, and um, we're, you know, waiting for the moment to occur and not knowing exactly what's going to happen. Okay, I'm going to go out of that corner. I'm staying in. Don't forget the VIP. Okay, switching the tracker. 170. Okay, switch the tracker. 170. 
There were more jokes, but uh, we'll just we'll just end it there. So so after that was all over, um, you know, Jason was tasked with with putting together the paper and identifying all the lines. Um, I showed them all here. Uh, it's one of the more beautiful spectra that we've ever taken. Um, and then the final product, of course, is uh, you know Jason becoming a, a, a doctor and getting his PhD. Um, this is the same experience that Paul uh, you know provided to to some 40 odd students over the years. And um, we were all privileged to be able to take part of that. And we thank him very much for his trust in us. Okay, uh, Alan Stern, are you out there? I am, Hal. How do you hear me? Uh, we hear you great. All right, go ahead and start, and I'll flip the slides for you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me start by saying I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in Baltimore today. I'm out in Arizona for another commitment, but I really wish I could have been uh, there with all of you. And I also want to say that I'm honored and really touched to have been asked to speak today um, I uh, have spent my entire career in, in awe of Paul and his leadership and his many accomplishments uh, and uh, the, the crazy uh, pace of discovery that he led in uh, planetary studies of comets and upper atmospheres across five different decades. Uh, let me first begin by speaking about how I came to meet Paul. Um, I was working for Charlie Barth, who was the director of the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. I wasn't even a graduate student. I'm sorry? Uh, ignore the background. Okay, all right. So I was, speak I was working for Charlie Barth before I was a graduate student. And Charlie, who was an expert in the uh, study of upper atmospheres of the Earth and the planets, had been selected uh, to fly a pair of ultraviolet spectrometers to observe Halley's Comet, perhaps the most famous of all the comets. And Halley was to come uh, into an apparition which we could observe it in 1986. Uh, Charlie was not an expert in comets. He gave me a lot of papers to read and virtually all of them in ultraviolet spectroscopy were Paul Feldman uh, led papers. And then Charlie invited Paul to come out to Boulder where we were uh, to work with us for a week and really to, um, uh, to help school us in how to do a comet mission right. And uh, I was completely intimidated having read Paul's papers, um, but uh, found him a warm and really enjoyable colleague and someone who was willing to mentor me as a young person. And then uh, following uh, that experience, I ended up working with Paul for four decades on uh, papers, on missions, uh, on uh, observations using the International Ultraviolet Explorer and Hubble Space Telescope observatories, uh, and on a couple of sounding rocket campaigns, particularly the Hale-Bopp campaign. And Paul was, to me, someone who always knew more than anybody else in the room about ultraviolet spectroscopy. And with all due respect to Hal, um, Paul was, in my eyes, a god of ultraviolet spectroscopy. If I can have the next slide, I wanna talk about the Rosetta mission. Uh, this is the European Space Agency mission that Hal mentioned earlier, very large mission launched by a very large rocket, this Ariane rocket, to be the first mission to go and actually not just fly by and briefly visit, but to, uh, to orbit and stay with and study a comet in detail as it evolved, as it moved closer to the sun, and then again, away from the sun. 
And when uh, the Europeans put together their call for proposals, uh, NASA had uh, uh, arranged to provide a few of the instruments. Uh, and I formed a team to provide an ultraviolet spectrometer. We competed with several other teams and ultimately won. And I believe that one of the most important reasons for our winning that first opportunity to send an ultraviolet spectrometer to return data from a comet at close range was because of our team. Uh, I was a pretty young planetary astronomer at the time that we proposed this in the early 1990s. And I recruited the four strongest ultraviolet spectroscopists of comets in the world. Uh, uh, I started with Paul and then added Micah Hearn and Michel Festu and Jean-Luc Berteau, all a generation older than me. And there was nobody better. There wasn't an obvious fifth. Those were the four titans of ultraviolet spectroscopy of comets. And I think that the strength of our team uh, with Paul as the centerpiece um, was perhaps among the most important reasons that we won. If I can have the next slide. Uh, this is a illustration that shows the comet that we went to, uh, a comet uh, CG or 67P, uh, relative to the size of Boulder, Colorado, where I live. Uh, and uh, the mission, as Hal said, was really audacious uh, because comets are uh, not only scientifically mouthwatering, but in addition, they're very difficult environments because they're spewing gases and dust, and in some cases, boulders and other hazards to the spacecraft and the instrumentation on board. Nonetheless, the Europeans built this mission. Uh, it was originally planned to launch uh, and arrive at a comet around, a different comet around 2012. But unfortunately, the rocket that we had planned to launch on, uh, uh, that particular kind of rocket called an Ariane 5, had suffered um, a catastrophic failure on a launch just prior to ours, which caused the Rosetta mission to be delayed and to have to replan. And we went to this other comet, the one that is shown here. Um, and that may have been a blessing in disguise, but nonetheless, if I can have the next slide, um, uh, this fantastic observatory laden with more than a dozen instruments and as Hal said, a lander to go down to the comet, um, had to wait about two years um, after all the instrumentation was built. Uh, the spacecraft was more or less crated up and, and uh, left in a clean room while we awaited the right geometry to launch to this new comet, uh, Chermunov Gerasimenko. Next slide. We did launch. Uh, in early 2004, and Paul was down there at the launch with our team, of course. And the end result of this was a 10-year journey that reached the comet in 2014 for a two-year mission to orbit the comet and study it in every respect. Um, the project itself, uh, which had been authorized in 1995, lasted until 2016. So this was a 21-year project in which we spent the first seven or eight years building and preparing to go fly, and then about nine years flying to the comet. And then uh, the real icing on the cake was, of course, the orbital mission from 2014 to 2016. Now, at the same time that we were arriving at the comet, I was involved in another mission. And that, that mission is called New Horizons, a purely NASA mission to fly across the solar system and make the first exploration of Pluto. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the delay in Rosetta that caused us to launch later and go to a different comet and arrive in 2014. Uh, uh, it turned out that the Rosetta mission and the New Horizons mission were returning their data at virtually the same time. And I was simply put overloaded, uh, completely overloaded with the responsibility to lead New Horizons at the same time uh, that we were conducting this orbital investigation of a comet. Next slide, please. Now, this is the instrument that we had built and we named it ALICE, it's just a name, it's not an acronym. You see, it's not very large, but because we brought it very close to the comet, we were able to make a wide variety of discoveries and see a wide variety of phenomena uh, to learn things about comets that you just can't learn from even much, very much larger instruments like the Hubble Space Telescope. And this particular instrument I wanna point out um, has a heritage, a, a design heritage that goes back to Johns Hopkins, in particular to Bill Fasti, a 
close colleague and mentor of Paul's who had uh, designed uh, an optical system called an Ebert Fasti system for ultraviolet spectrometers on which the Alice ultraviolet spectrometer was originally based. Next slide. Do you have a blank slide? No, that was it, Alan, for yours. Oh, I have a number of, of uh, other slides that I thought we had in this package. Um, but let me just say, and if we could just stay on this, um, this introductory slide, yeah. that it was uh, really the privilege of a career uh, to be able to work with Paul in this investigation and the other things that we did. I always found him to be uh, 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 helpful and uh, uh, as hard of working as anybody in the room. And this is a picture of our uh, very small uh, Rosetta team uh, in the early days. This is a picture taken on the Isle of Capri in 2003, just a few months before the mission was launched. And uh, there I am on the right where the pal has the cursor um, closest to the camera on the right side. And uh, when I ran across this picture in preparing for uh, this uh, presentation to you, it really struck me in a, in a very deep and visceral way because all of these individuals are close colleagues and friends. But unfortunately, most of the people in the image have now passed. The man to my right, on the right side, Dave Slater, who had been my postdoc, um, sadly passed away in 2011. And all of those who are on the left, Michelle Festu, Micah Hearn, Claudia Alexander, and Paul have now left us. Uh, only Joel Parker, who's on this, on this um, uh, celebration of Paul's life, uh, and Jean-Luc Berteau, who's next to him in the red, uh, and myself uh, remain. But those were uh, fond memories. And uh, I want to close with a story. Um, some of you know a little bit about this story and others don't. But um, once I was flying out to Baltimore on a United flight, and I was randomly, randomly seated next to Paul's daughter, Kathy, who I did not know. And uh, as we were making a little bit of friendly conversation, we discovered uh, uh, that we had Paul in common and many other friends and colleagues as a result. And we ended up uh, uh, just having a wonderful conversation the entire way across the continent out uh, to the East Coast, made a landing in Baltimore very late at night and went our separate ways. Uh, uh, Kathy had asked me many questions about her dad and his career and his accomplishments and so forth and so on. And, uh, and I remember waking up the next morning and uh, looking at my email and seeing a message from Paul, who must have spoken with Kathy overnight or in the morning. And that email was very short, but it, uh, it really was the, the cherry on top of that wonderful evening and that wonderful conversation uh, with Kathy. And Paul's email was very succinct. All it said was, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and let me end by saying thank you to all of you for this invitation to speak. And a big thank you to Paul for the mentorship that he gave uh, within our team and to me in, in the many projects that we worked on together. And thank you, Paul, for the many lasting contributions to human knowledge of comets and uh, atmospheres across the solar system. Uh, your hard work, your dedication, your camaraderie, uh, uh, and your lifelong efforts will never be forgotten. Thank you very much. What a, what a wonderful story in a small world, right? You know, <laughs> um, seeing Kathy on the plane. Uh, please, those of you who are online, uh, please remember to mute your phones if you're not actually one of the speakers. So uh, we, we keep getting interrupted. So uh, we'd like that, to stop that if we can. Next up is Daryl Strobel. Yeah, yeah, I gather if you chew on the mic, you'll be successful. <laughs> Hi, I'm Daryl Strobel. I am currently an academy and research closer yet. Wow. Wow. Okay. So I'm Daryl Strobel. I have been at Hopkins since 1984. I quote unquote retired as a tenured for life professor in 2019. I'm still around as an academy and research professor. Uh, I've known Paul for about a half a century. 
And the, uh, let's see, I've got to this way, right? Yep. Okay, so the occasion of meeting Paul was the following. He came down to the Naval Research Lab in sometime like late 1973, uh, and he knew I had just joined the Plasma Physics Division at NRL, and he had this rocket flight uh, to measure spectra of the comet of the century. The media had really advertised this thing as the best thing you're ever going to see. And if you're old enough, you probably remember that. Well, it turned out the Star Tracker was looking for this comet of the century and never found it. And what Paul got out of it was beautiful spectra of the night glow in the Earth's atmosphere. And I had been working on the photochemistry of molecular nitrogen uh, in the Earth's atmosphere since 1969. And Paul sort of knew I was looking for data to basically validate aspects of the model for which there were not laboratory measurements. And so that was the first meeting. Uh, we eventually, after his student, Peter Takis, published the paper, we wrote a joint paper, which is listed at the bottom. And he invited me up, I think it was in the spring of 1974, to give a colloquium in the physics department. I can't remember what the talk was about, but what I do remember is Paul said, you're a civil servant, you can't get an honorarium. But as far as we know, there is no law against you eating it. So they took me downtown to one of these Baltimore crab places. And of course, you know, you have this carnage of all these shells and you've been eating and you're not getting full. So finally, they cleared the table and brought in crab cakes. And of course, it had so much Old Bay spice, you had to keep drinking beer after beer after beer. So that was my introduction uh, to Baltimore. Then in 1984, I took a faculty position here and in the primary appointment was in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science. I became, after 16 years, their first planetary scientist. And my task was to basically get the Tartan into the space age and to interact with Space Telescope Science Institute. And it turned out not only was Paul here in the physics department, but Warren Moose, who was my co-investor colleague with the Voyager UV spectrometers. So I had two people here. So what do you do with space telescope? Well, there's these Galilean satellites. If you took a course in history of astronomy or history of science, you talked about Galileo seeing the miniature solar system with these Galilean satellites in the upper left-hand corner. Now the, the EU is in the most upper right, uh, left-hand corner. And NASA embellished that to look like a Domino's pizza. If you look in the lower left-hand corner there, you can see EO that is more true to color. So basically, uh, if you ask anybody in the early 70s, tell me something about the atmospheres of these objects, they, you'd get a blank look because nobody knew anything about them. Now, when Voyager flew by in March of 1973, uh, they saw up to eight volcanoes going off. So now, basically, people started taking interest in the Galilean satellites. The trouble was this Hubble Space Telescope, which is the telescope we really needed, didn't get launched in 86 because of the Challenger disaster. So we had to wait till the 1990s. And then, of course, you had to wait till the guaranteed time observers uh, were over. But anyway, that's what we sort of chose as a topic to uh, pursue. So if you look at Jupiter's volcanic uh, moon, you know, and the other thing I tell you is in Jupiter's magnetosphere, the environment is harsh from radiation. Uh, to give you a fiducial marker, if you were on the surface of EU, your life expectancy would be 15 minutes. So obviously we're not climbing any manned missions to EO. So in the visible in the upper left-hand corner, if you look at it in the infrared, you basically see where the volcanoes are and some glow on the side. And then if you take a picture in the oxygen uh, line at 1356, that basically shows you where the aurora is. EO doesn't have an intrinsic or an induced magnetic field, so the aurora occurs at the equator. You see a line there that indicates the direction of the B field. 
So the particles, energetic particles are moving up and down and they get closest to the surface at the equator. And as the magnetic field rocks back and forth relative to EU, so does the aurora. And then if you look at the lower left-hand corner, that is a, taken an image at the Lyman Alpha, the strongest solar line. And there was a huge debate in the original paper with this image of what it meant. And Paul decided to run with it uh, and interpret it as basically this was a flashlight shining down on the surface. The light in the UV was reflected back. If it's bright, there's no atmosphere there. Where it's dark, there's more atmosphere. And once there are enough data there, you can see all the pixels. And eventually it became a PhD thesis for Lori Feggy, uh, where she basically analyzed essentially the distribution of SO2. So we not only then knew that there was SO2 there, which we had from the Voyager flyby, but only for the volcanic eruptions, but it basically had a well-distributed atmosphere, mostly in equatorial and low latitudes because that's where most of the volcanoes are. So, and then on to the next one, uh, Europa. Now Europa has the most ice coverage of all, big thick ice crust and the, Hypothesis was that basically Europa had could have an H2 atmosphere, uh, uh, O2 atmosphere, and of course it could have O and H atoms. And basically, in this harsh environment of the magnetosphere, you were basically sputtering material off. O2 was the heaviest. And so Paul suggested, well, let's take a look at the oxygen lines, which are associated with atomic oxygen, and see what we get. And what we get is you can see the oxygen 1356 is much brighter than the oxygen 1304. And the fiducial carbon plus at 1335 is used to tell us something about the albedo of the surface. And so, but you see since 1356 is about twice as bright as 1304, that tells us it's O2 not O. If it was O, it would be the inverse. It would be the ratio of 1304 would be much larger, say two and a half times. So basically it showed that Europa had an oxygen atmosphere. Not much, but it was there. The column density was quite low. And that was, of course, a nature paper. And I remember a reporter calling up my colleague in Paris, Manuel Luce, saying, is there life on Europa? I said, you should have told them if an elephant took one deep breath, it would be gone. Now, later on, when we had the STIS, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, we, we took images of uh, Europa. And, and the story that goes with this is the following. If you look at the second author, Joachim Sauer, he was my visiting graduate student for a semester in 1965, he was my postdoc in 2001. I was the second reader on his thesis at uh, the University of Cologne. And five years after his PhD, he got a full professorship at the University of Cologne. Well, he had a graduate student, Lorenz Roth, uh, and he sent him over as a visiting graduate student in 2010. Now they all wanted to basically become HST observers. So I said, you don't want to be trained by me. You want to be trained by Paul. And I had an office over here. So I said, go over and visit Paul occasionally and get the, learn the ropes, how to do it. And here is one of the products of that. And what you see where you see these 12 and 13 is an image. And if you take the ratio of the Lyman alpha, the 12, six, well, it's 121.6 nanometers to the oxygen 1304, and what's not on here is 13. It had precisely the ratio to identify that you're seeing water off the limb in that location, i.e. there's water vapor plumes. And Europa has, as we know from the magnetometer on the Galileo spacecraft, an induced field. How do you get an induced field? Well, you need a conducting fluid in the interior. What better conducting fluid is liquid water with enough salt about the amount we have in our oceans that would give you the conductivity to produce that field. 
And so with the discovery of these plumes, I'm quoting from Jim Green, who is, was the chief scientist, and it was in the New York Times for you that read it on January 2nd. He said, the plumes on Europa are what made the Europa Clipper mission happen. That's the flagship mission. It will probably cost at least what the Hubble did. So this basically uh, cemented those that are involved with that mission to go forward. Okay, another thing is we moved out to Ganymede. Ganymede has an intrinsic magnetic field. We knew that again from the Galileo spectrometer, uh, magnetometer. And so with a, its own field, basically the aurora now is like the earth. You have at high latitudes, the aurora. And so where you see these bright white spots, it outlines essentially where the magnetic field at some altitude flips from under control by the intrinsic field of Ganymede over to Jupiter's powerful magnetic field outside. And so along those transition is where the aurora occurs. And this is what Ganymede looks in. And of course, Paul led this paper back in 2000. And, and then and just recently, there's a paper by one of the Occam Sowers that's uh, almost accepted that has taken all of the data and basically mapped out you know, how this ha uh, aurora develops as you go around Jupiter. Okay, so sort of to wrap it up, uh, there was another important problem from the Voyager mission, and that is that each time we looked at Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, we found that the day glow, in other words, what, how bright in the UV was these three planets. And it seemed that there was a missing energy source in all three. And so with the Hopkins Ultraviolet Telescope, we finally got an independent measure at much better resolution, three angstroms, not 30. And, and what Paul basically showed is that when you had this high resolution data, that you could basically explain it on, with known processes. UV sunlight on an H2 atmosphere. And, and of course, you in ionized species, the ions basically produce photoelectrons or, or from that process. And that basically produces more radiation. And when you do all the arithmetic, you end up basically having something you can explain without invoking an external uh, source. And part of the analysis that Paul did was based on something that went back to 1972. There is the Apollo 17 uh, UV spectrometer that he and Bill Fasti uh, were involved with, and they published what it was one of the classic papers in 1972. Uh, and the technique is the solar Lyman beta line basically excites the H2 in a peculiar way that sends a string of electronic Lyman bands that are diagnostic of the process. And that was one of the key things that Paul used in that paper uh, on Jupiter to identify one of the sources that you couldn't see when it was smeared out at 30 angstroms. And, and he also used it to also detect H2 on Mars. So it was something that paid off. And I believe somebody said it also in technique uh, uh, for one of the comments. And there is a variety of other papers that were published. And what I wanted to sort of highlight at the end here is that you don't see first authors always the professor. You see students, postdocs, and so forth. And that will naturally lead into the next speaker, Melissa, uh, who uh, started out here in, what is it, 87 as a postdoc. And she'll probably tell you more. And then I think I have one final slide. Uh, I made no claim to be a super expert on spectroscopy or spaceborne instrumentation. I basically let Paul do that. You tell me what you saw and I will try and interpret it. And we used to get together when I had an office over here at least once a week with a bag lunch. And my office was also used when we would basically interact with the students and so forth. And when Hal used to come up to campus, he could use the desk. I see Ethan Schreier, he had access to the desk. So I basically made it like the group facility. <laughs>
So I had a great time with Paul and we exploring the solar system uh, as and never really got involved in the comet, but we used to talk about spectroscopy of comets a lot. And you know, it was basically, what should I say, an esoteric subject probably to many people, but it's something that Paul and I enjoyed very much. And I really value the fact that he was my friend, not only a, a colleague for 50 years. So thank you. Hello, I'm Melissa McGrath. I was a postdoctoral fellow and then associate research scientist here in the department from 1988 until 1992 when I did what we used to call the San Martin Shuffle and moved across the street to a science staff position at the Space Telescope Science Institute where I stayed for another 13 years, continuing to work closely with Paul and the rest of the planetary science group here at Hopkins. In all the helping and advising and mentoring Paul did over the years, to me, one of his greatest qualities was that he led by example. He didn't just answer questions or explain how to do things, although he did that extremely well too. He showed us. He worked hard. He had very good technical skills. He was always the first person to jump all over new data to quickly pull out the cream. He showed us how to do it well. So many times in the last few months as I've thought about Paul, um, I was reminded of words I had read some time ago about Margaret Mead. One of those who came by and left their footprints on a trail that led in more directions than most people would ever dream of going. If you wanted to work with Paul to follow him in even one direction, you had better be on your toes and you better run as fast as you could to keep up with him. But at the same time, Paul really well embodied that familiar adage, work to live, don't live to work. Or in the more elegant words of author Anna Quinlan, you cannot be really first rate at your work if your work is all you are. Paul loved science, but he loved many other things too. And he shared that love of many other things, Baltimore history, Johns Hopkins history. Many times I would come into work and Paul would hand me a pair of concert tickets. Joan and, I, Joan and I can't go, we thought you might enjoy it. We didn't just learn science, we learned life. Another aspect of the environment here that I found remarkable was that it was a true team effort. I didn't have one mentor when I was here. I had three, Warren Moose, Paul Feldman, and Daryl Strobel, and they worked virtually seamlessly as a great team. I wasn't clear a lot of the time who the formal PhD advisor actually was. It was hard to tell. Many times I remember coming up with solutions to problems during group meetings where it was shown over and over and over again that three heads or five heads or seven heads really are better than one. There were so many exciting things going on here. You've heard about a lot of them. But even if you weren't working on those things, the rocket program, HUT, FUSE, the brand new Hubble Space Telescope, you still felt like part of the much larger team because someone was always running in with a new spectrum or new instrument gadget and saying, look, look, look at what I've found, look at what we've discovered. It was a really wonderful environment to work in. Our mentors here used their cloud to help us grow and grow into more and more challenging and visible rules. Paul in particular demonstrated on several teams, especially Rosetta, which was a European led mission to a comet, how important team building is. Lori Figge, a Hopkins PhD that Paul and I jointly supervised, who is now a research professor at the University of Maryland shared this. Paul showed again and again that he could reach out across instruments and countries to get more complete results with complementary data sets. That was a great challenge and a great success on his part. With that type of team spirit, it really became a science family. 
I remember going to conferences and meeting Hopkins alums who didn't know me from a hole in a wall. But when they found out I was at Hopkins, I immediately became part of the extended science family, no questions asked. Paul made a point of keeping the science family together. He was always the one who arranged a group dinner at conferences, or when I left Baltimore, he arranged a going away lunch at the Hopkins Club. And that you're part of the team was especially important for us females here at Hopkins. When I came to Hopkins in the late 1980s, the physics and astronomy department was still very male dominated. There were very few female professors. For most of the time I was here, I was the only female postdoc in the, in the entire department. At one point I counted the number of graduate students. There were 88, four of them were women. That was a tough environment if you were a woman, but because of Paul and others, it was not hostile for most of the women. Instead, for many of us, we still remember it as being some of the best and happiest time of our entire career. Hilda ba Ballister put it beautifully. I have always been so grateful for the way you welcomed me at Johns Hopkins. I always remember how much I learned with you about spectroscopy, and throughout my JHU years, you taught me so much about so many topics. But what I am most grateful about is that you always treated me with respect and made me feel welcomed in the world of astrophysics. You made me feel that I belonged. When I met Joan Feldman, she was also an inspiration to us because the message we got was, we value strong, intelligent women. And I always knew how important it was to Paul that we be treated the way he wanted his own daughters to be treated as they climbed the ladder to success with respect and like, you belong, we value you, we value your contribution, we want you here. Another thing that really impressed me here was that there was great honor and respect paid to those who had come before us and paved the way for us. By the time I got here, Bill Fasti was retired and I only saw him in person a few times, but I heard so many stories about Bill and what he had accomplished, about the famed Roland spectrograph and many other stories of Hopkins lore. I remember really well when Bill Fasti was in failing health, how Paul went to visit him. Your lessons were very well learned, Paul, because I watched from a distance, as many of you did exactly the same thing for Paul in his last few months. I watched several generations of students become leaders and knew of many that happened before I got here. But one of the most memorable for me started with Kurt Rutherford's PhD thesis defense in 2002. Paul and I were both on Kurt's thesis committee and after his oral presentation, I remember another non-astronomer physics professor who was also on the committee said to Paul and I, well, if he could survive you two, he certainly deserves a PhD. And Kurt certainly did. Today, 20 years later, Kurt is leading the team, building an instrument to fly to Jupiter, a team on which both Paul and I were now supporting co-investigators. Kurt wrote a beautiful tribute to Paul for our Europa Clipper team. Paul's enthusiasm for science was palpable and infectious and came through clearly in every conversation, whether it was regarding the big picture impact of discoveries, the nitty gritty of data analysis or plotting codes, the art of building UV spaceflight instruments or the salient details of atomic and molecular physics. His contributions to the Clipper mission science will be appreciated for years to come. Lastly, and most personally, his dedication to student mentorship and ability to teach constructive skepticism serves as a role model for how I mentor my own students and lead the UVS investigation. Up to the end, he provided sage advice to one of my grad students on an LRO LAMP paper we published last month. The support and mentoring from Paul continued long after we left Baltimore. 
I sent Paul a message very shortly before learning of his declining health. I still, still depended on him for help with detailed spectroscopy issues. He was still the go-to person for many of us. Years after I left Baltimore, I got a call from Paul saying, I need your CV. And I said, okay, well, sure, what's up? He said, I'm so tired of the medical school winning all the awards and prizes here. We need to show how good the physics department is. So we're going to nominate you for the Johns Hopkins University Society of Scholars. And sure enough, leave it to Paul. In short order, first I and then Joachim Sauer found ourselves inducted into the Society of Scholars, an honorary society for postdocs who've made good. In her autobiography, the brilliant astrophysicist Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin wrote, young people often ask me for advice. Here it is, Valiat Quantum. Do not undertake a scientific career in quest of fame or money. There are easier and better ways to reach them. Undertake it only if nothing else will satisfy you. Your reward will be the widening of the horizon as you climb. And if you achieve that reward, you will ask no other. I know for sure that Paul achieved that reward many, many times over as he climbed. We are very lucky that he was so generous in sharing the beauty of the scenery along the way with us. Your life was a blessing, your memory a treasure. You are loved beyond words and missed beyond measure. On behalf of all of us who Paul helped, advised, and mentored throughout the years, let me just end with two very simple but sincere words for you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, um, next, uh, Warren Moose, longtime colleague and friend. Good morning. You can hear me. Is that close enough? All right. Um, Paul was a longtime colleague and friend. And uh, when I got this assignment, um, I realized I couldn't compete with all the people who have gone before me. But, you know, I thought about it and I thought, you know, Paul and I are both New York City boys. And uh, there's a sort of commonality. We're both the children of immigrants. Uh, we're, we only differ by, we're born in Brooklyn too. Uh, the, um, we're, we're only three years apart. I'm, I'm three years older. But, and you know, how did Paul get to where, oh, by the way, we're both trained in atomic physics. Would you think it would be mute or? <laughs> yes, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, we're both trained in atomic physics. Uh, but but three years apart, I came and I came to Hopkins three years ahead of him, so on and so forth. But the, think about his career. Uh, you know that he went to Columbia. You know that he sp spent four years as an undergraduate, and then he went into physics graduate school. Uh, he finished in four years, by the way. Four years is phenomenal. Okay. This is some indication of his energy and of his talent. Uh, I mean, I think back over the years of training students, I probably have 40 or 50 PhDs under my belt. And yet I can only think of a few who have finished in four years in, in that early short period. He worked for a very tough professor for his thesis, a man named Robert Novick, who had done his work under Willis Lamb, the Nobel laureate. One of, the things, one of the things about the Columbia Physics Department was that almost every other professor had a, had a Nobel laureate. It was an awesome place to be. It was exciting. Uh, 
and it was a little scary. Novik was part of that product of that system, and they sent him out to the country, to Illinois. And finally, you know, after he uh, got promoted at Illinois, I, I was a graduate student in Michigan then, and they and we knew about Novik. He was a comer. He was a young guy in the field who was making things happen. And so Columbia hired him back. He, he showed that he could do it. They hired him back, and he they kept him as an associate professor for a few years, but. Paul went to work for him on a very tough project. Paul learned a lot of atomic physics from the very best people in the world. All right, that, that's the point I want to make. He went from there to the uh, Naval Research Laboratory, where he spent three years on a very difficult project uh, having to do with uh, infrared astronomy. I would say that infrared astronomy did not really solve its problem. By the way, to show how difficult it is, I would say that infrared astronomy has not really solved its problems until the launch last Christmas day of the, of the Webb telescope. It's a very, very te technically very difficult thing to do. Despite that, his, with his training in atomic physics, Paul will continue to publish papers on atmospheric emissions that were observed. He then came to Baltimore. In Baltimore, there was data. There was lots of data. There were people who wanted to have the data interpreted. And he just, he, it, was, it was just like, you know, handing candy to a kid. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and he set out to analyze this data. Now, let me just stop and make a comment, a quick comment. We talk a lot about data. Data is not the same as knowledge. Knowledge is much, and this is what Paul did. Paul could look at data and he could turn it into scientific knowledge. That's a unique skill. I'll give you an example that's perhaps a little easier to understand. You have a pain in your arm. You have a pain in your chest. You go to see a physician. The physician, that, that's data. The pain in your arm and the pain in your chest. The physician says, you have a heart condition. I want you to go to the emergency room. That's knowledge. And that's where Paul excelled. He could look at the results of an experiment and tell you what was going on. And that's unique. Well, it didn't take long before he literally, you know, he, he, things just sort of fell into his lap. He was a person that you had to come to to, to, to get, the, get the job done. And as has been discussed here, one, one mission after another, drew on his skills. Now, what's interesting is, here's this very bright, brilliant scientist who's extremely energetic, and yet he was a warm, yes, I can use the word loving. He was a, he was a friend. He was a person that people like to be with. And I think this is the way we remember him. I, I always remember that, uh, we would have a, a picnic for the uh, experimental astrophysics students. And they'd all come out, you know, and they'd bring a net and set up a volley, volleyball court and destroy my lawn. <laughs> the, but, but Paul was in the middle of this. Now, sometimes on Monday morning, he'd be complaining about the aches and pains. So there were some perils to this, but, but the point was he was in the middle of it and, 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 I, and thoroughly enjoying it. And I think that it's just one more example of, 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 his, of his warm uh, personality. I think, I don't, I don't really have anything else to say. I, I think it, it's all been said here. He was brilliant. He was energetic. Uh, 
He was warm. He was a caring person. We will miss him. Okay, uh, we're going to have another musical interlude. Afalda is going to play again for us. And then we'll have some family re remembrances. Do you know who that is? Beautiful. So, wow, uh, it's just been a tremendous morning already. And um, I continue to learn things about my father. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm Kathy Feldman, um, the older daughter. Um, also Catherine, depending on when in the course of my life you met me. Um, I answer to both. Um, I generally think I'm in trouble if I hear Kathy. So Marion was already really articulate about um, how the Hopkins physics community was a second family, and, and I think that's been in evidence um, all morning. I also remember the, the department picnics that uh, were held at Evergreen House. I remember Bill Fasty from his crab feasts, not so much from his scientific accomplishments, but clearly he was a giant. Um, I remember dad's 10 year party as a momentous event, not because it meant he get to keep, um, keep his job for a really long time, but because mom and dad got a keg of Guinness. And this was a huge novelty at the time and demonstrated their um, you know, readiness to dive into gastronomic adventures. <laughs> 
I eagerly anticipated souvenirs from dad's travels as he explored the skies from distant lands, and I have many of those still today. I was so humbled by all I learned um, during the course of dad's illness and, and after he passed away by the letters that came in from colleagues and, and former students and postdocs, um, and wish I'd known so many of those things um, when he was alive so I could ask him more about them and, and watch him in action. And to follow on Alan's story from earlier, we were on the plane. I don't always chit chat. So, um, so for whatever reason, I was talkative that evening and, and we did have a lovely conversation. And I remember Alan's comment as I asked him about my father, he said, have you ever seen a CV? I was like, no, why, why would I have seen my father's CV? That's not, nothing a, a kid has seen, I, I, or not the context you know your father in. And I have since seen my father's CV and it is truly um, monumental. Um, but I have, I have relished that connection to Alan over the years. So, um, and, and to the whole scientific community that my dad was um, obviously so much a, a vibrant part of. Since dad passed away in January, we're going through a series of firsts. My mom had her birthday shortly after dad passed away, her first birthday without dad. Valentine's Day quickly followed. So she, she got to go through that without my father. And Mother's Day, of course, was just last weekend. And, and dad, of course, made her a mother. Dad really loved good food and fine wine. Um, and in recent years, we've gathered for Father's Day at Black Ankle Vineyards, a beautiful winery in Mount Airy, Maryland, that produces just spectacular wines. And of course, we, we're going to have to figure out how to navigate that coming up next month, the first year that Marion and I won't, won't have our father with us to celebrate in person. Dad was a real Renaissance man and could engage knowledgeably and at length in intellectual discussions on so many topics. And I've already had a few folks today tell me how much they enjoyed talking to him about all sorts of things. I wish I could talk to him about the atrocities that are ongoing in, in Ukraine right now, which would hold personal meaning as his parents immigrated to the US from that part of the world. He played tennis and he loved watching the sport. Mom and dad, it was, it was another thing they shared. They would follow the players and the various tournaments and we could always chart the seasons by whether tennis was being played on grass at Wimbledon or with a Brooklyn accent at Flushing Meadows in, in, at the US Open. Dad was truly passionate about music and I would simpl simplistically describe his tastes as classical and opera, but Edie Stern is gonna wax more eloquent on his musical preferences shortly. At the end of the day, after dinner, you could find him attending to work or reading a journal surrounded, and I mean surrounded, by his music in his large Bolton Hill study that was filled with many, many shelves of records, his cello and his sheet music, and artifacts from his 1973 travels in Africa to observe a total solar eclipse. Now, ours was the only household I know in which the teenager would yell at her parent to turn the music down. Mom and dad shared many travel adventures to far off lands like India and Greece, to his beloved Italy and France, and closer to home destinations such as New York City. Dad often sought out music during his travels or based his travels around musical events. Last summer, he bought tickets to see Don Carlos in New York City this past March. He was so excited because he had never seen the five act version of the opera sung in French. He'd only ever seen the four act version sung in Italian. So even when we, he was in the hospital late, late last year, he would reference with hope the upcoming trip to New York City with mom to lose themselves for five hours <laughs> at the Metropolitan Opera. Dad died a couple of months before the production and mom was unsure how to approach this event without my father. In the end, I was honored to accompany my mom to Don Carlos. And because my father was with me in spirit, I not only stayed awake the entire five hours, but was swept up in the performance. Both mom and I wish we could debrief with him after and would have loved to have heard what he thought about the production, whether it lived up to expectations and whether five acts in French was superior to four acts in Italian. I'm the nature enthusiast in my family and remember uh, feeling slight indignation when uh, my father, the ultimate city slicker, despite the Grand Canyon picture you saw, um, when dad and mom were given quite literally a free ride on a Hopkins cruise to the Galapagos, where dad was gonna serve as the resident astronomer. And so very different from their more usual urbane European destinations, that trip really fed dad's passions for uh, travel and photography, 
and was the start of a new interest for him, bird watching. Given I enjoy bird watching too, this had a long-term benefit for me as we now had another shared interest, even if I missed out on the uh, adventure itself. And bird watching was yet another window through which he engaged with the world around him. When I think of dad and birds, I think of warm ocean breezes wafting past us while we gazed at the magnificent um, frigate birds flying overhead in the Florida Keys. I remember dad scanning the ocean from the Indian River Inlet in Delaware with a scope, looking for long-tailed ducks, scoters, and eiders out in the surf. And I savor so many memories of the many great family meals that we shared while watching tufted titmice, ruby-throated hummingbirds, cardinals, red-bellied woodpeckers from my or my sister's deck. And with a nod to that fateful trip to the Galapagos, a blue-footed booby stuffed animal became an honorary member of our family and was a stalwart companion of my dad's till his very end. Dad was a devoted family man. He worked to live. And while not particularly demonstrative with hugs or in words, you could see him shining with pride at each of my sisters and my successes. He absolutely delighted in his grandkids, Owen, Dylan, Lisa and Tara, I don't know where you are. Please raise your hands. There they are, Lisa and Tara. There's an obvious sparkle in his eyes in all the photos of him with them as babies, toddlers, elementary and middle school aged adults, and now as the fine young adults that they're growing into. I hope the grandkids have gained greater insights today into Papa's accomplishments and his character. And as they continue to go down their own paths, I urge you, to be inspired by his approach to living life to the fullest and engaging with the world around you, around him. So I'd just like to close by thanking you for allowing me to share these memories of my father, Paul Feldman, beloved husband to my mom, Joan, Marion's and my dad, and Tara's and Lisa's and Dylan's and Owen's papa. May his memory be for a blessing. Okay, Paul's sister. I assume you can hear me in the back. Um, I love that picture. My mother loved it. I think um, I'm about four, and so that made Paul about eight. Um, he's, he's, he's the big brother. And I've learned a lot about what he did in his career today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our family and what it was like to be his little sister and about his, his childhood. My parents, our parents, Mar and Lazar Feldman, as was mentioned, came to this country in the 1930s from Eastern Europe. They were both came from educated middle-class Jewish families. Lazar's father was a pharmacist. Mara's father was a grain merchant. The region, their hometowns, Lazar's was Ismail, Mara's was Kalia, are both on the North shore of the Danube River where it meets the Black Sea. People, I don't think realize the Danube keeps going south of Bucharest hangs the right and goes into the Black Sea. And, and when they were growing up in the 1920s and 30s, it was part of Romania. After World War II, it became part of Ukraine. But by then, we didn't have any family members left there. When Paul was born in November of 1939, Mar and Lazar were living in the Borough Park section of Brooklyn. Lazar, who was a trained pharmacist also, like his father, was working as a chemist in a chemical plant in Brooklyn. But Mara wanted to own her own home. So in June of 1950, we moved to Floral Park in Queens, which is the very edge of the city. If you went three more blocks, you were in Nassau. It was a much more religiously and ethnically diverse neighborhood than Borough Park. When we moved there, some of the streets were still unpaved. It was an area that was 
built up one family homes for all those returning GIs and their booming families. Lots of kids, school age kids, and we played stickball in the middle of the street. We had a dog named Sparky. If I had known, I would have sent pictures of us with Sparky. Mara had a little garden. We raised tomatoes and strawberries. We had a peach tree in the backyard. Paul was in the Boy Scouts. The house had an unfinished second floor. And with help from some of the neighbors, Lazar finished it as a bedroom for Paul. So he had his own space away from the pesky little sister. Like many big brothers, he did not like to share his toys. I think he outgrew that later. One of his friends in seventh grade mentioned that he was going to Hebrew class. Paul knew he was Jewish, so he went along. A few days later, a young rabbi came to visit my parents, which is how, in the end, Paul had a bar mitzvah. It was a small reform congregation that was still, at that time, meeting in a storefront. Although we're only four and a half years difference in age, Paul was six years ahead of me in school. They promoted him from grade 1A to grade 2B. So he was always the youngest in his class. But because he was tall, nobody ever noticed. Years later, he told me he thought it was a bad idea. I recently found in an unlikely place a letter that he wrote probably when he was in fourth or fifth grade, inviting his mother to a play, The Melting Pot in New York City. It was given in the auditorium of PS 180 in Brooklyn. As he mentioned in the oral, his, oral history, going to Brooklyn Technical High School was a terrible commute. That was, that was the trade-off of living in Floral Park. You had to take a bus to the end of the subway or two buses to get any place. But the, he and Lazar still found time to build an HO gauge railroad set with a very elaborate um, layout. And I re specifically remember they were working very carefully with an X-Acto knife to make, a, make this texture on a water tower. The full scholarship to Columbia College made it possible for Paul to live on campus because to get to Columbia from Floral Park would have been another awful commute. But he could come home weekends. Paul was involved with the college radio station, KCR, WKCR, King's Crown Radio. He was the announcer for a classical radio program. So if he came home for the weekend, he would go back and at nine o'clock in the evening, we would tune in his program. And when we heard his voice, we knew he got back safely. At one point, uh, Paul had discovered Wagner's ring cycle. He was playing a recording of some part of it one weekend when he was home. A few days later, an elderly neighbor, Mr. Glantz, who lived across the street and one house over, stopped my father who was walking the dog. Mr. Glantz wanted to tell Lazar just how much he enjoyed the music. When I was in high school, I was having trouble with physics. Lazar said to Paul, you're a physics major, help your sister. Paul looked at the books and papers and said, they're teaching it to you all wrong. You need to learn to use a slide rule. Well, he was probably right. I never did learn how to use a slide rule. I know some pe young people here may not know what a slide rule is. You'll have to Google it. I also understand that they are considered obsolete tools. I remember that Paul traveled to Europe in 1961 for the first time. He, he, I didn't realize that he had been working there. He also visited our family in Oran. I think that was the time that he attended the music festival in Bayreuth and he met Joan Sutherland, the opera star. He was a fan. Every family has its myths and folklore. Ours had one about the reason Paul loved opera. 
Supposedly, in the summer of 1939, when she was pregnant with Paul, our mother Mara attended an opera. Was that the reason? Who knows? For years, I described Paul as my brother, the cello playing physicist who wanted to be an Italian when he grew up. I was born in Brooklyn, I grew up in Queens, but I've lived in the Boston area for more than 50 years. And I think the best description from my brother, especially witness to what we heard today, he was wicked awesome. Thank you. Okay, next up is Paul's cousin. Thank you, Florence. <laughs> I enjoy. Oh, slides. Sorry, we lost the uh, my fault. Thank you. Uh, well, now that we have all the various cousins, I don't know. And now? Oh, it's okay. Okay. Well, except for Florence, um, who, of course, saw Paul um, as a, at the moment she was born. <laughs> um, we are all here to remember Paul and celebrate his life, most of us who knew him as an adult, as a scientist, researcher, husband, parent, friend. When I first met him, he was barely out of his teens, and my memory goes to his sister, Florence, uh, who I think was 12 at the time. Um, and, um, and to his parents, the aunts, uncles, and especially his cousins. I had just arrived to the United States, it was 1958. I was married to Paul's cousin, Dan, and I was greeted with enormous warmth by Paul's family, who understood perfectly what it meant being a newcomer, a greenhorn, as they called it, in this country. They understood it so well because they had just barely left the very place that is at this moment, once again, embroiled in another terrible war. Paul's mother came from Kilia. That was her birthplace in Southern Ukraine, some four hour drive west of Odessa, possibly Southwest of Odessa, a place that is not new to wars and constant changes of occupiers. As pa Florence mentioned, it was at one point Romania, at one point Ukraine, at one point it was Russia. But if you go further back into history, as I did just recently, uh, it goes back to the Ottoman Empire, to the Turks. It is an incredible history and no wonder that there are people who think that it belongs to them. Everybody seems to think so. Well, by the 1920s, it was a very difficult place. And some of the family made decision to leave one by one. First, a sister, a brother, and finally later, the youngest, Mara, Paul's mother. They left behind an aging father and some distant relatives who would then lose their lives during the Holocaust. So it's not surprising that the family now in New York remained close and devoted to each other 
they were thrilled to be able to bring up new life as each of these siblings, the sister, the brother, and Mara, sister Clara, brother Manny, and then Mara, gave, uh, were able to have new, new, give new life, have new children. And they, uh, Mara and Laza welcomed Paul, um, whom, uh, and whom uh, Mara, who married Laza Feldman, and they had a child, Paul, and then, of course, Florence. This was the time of great hope for future accomplishment, great expectation for what these children were to accomplish. And they did so, most, mostly on their own, since I cannot imagine that their immigrant parents, much as they were educated, knew how to manage the American school system, the tuition waivers, the SATs, and everything that went with, went with it. It's therefore truly remarkable how this first generation got educated, prospered, and how much they accomplished. I got to know particularly well through my husband, Dan. They were possibly the closest of the cousins for a number of reasons. One, they both loved sciences. Um, the picture that you see behind me is of some of the cousins, but at, that, at the point at this which picture was taken, my husband is already gone. And um, that was one of the sad things that happened to all of us. But in the 19, uh, early 1960s, uh, it was a fantastic time because we had moved to Washington. We moved to Washington in 1959 for Dan to work uh, as an organic chemist at the Walter Reed Institute of Science uh, of Research. But at that point, uh, very shortly after, Paul and Joan fortunately moved to Washington, and we were thrilled. And then Kathy was born, and that was really great. We saw each other quite a bit at that time. It was wonderful to have them, and some parts of it were somewhat difficult. They lived down near the Capitol, uh, on, the Cap on Capitol Hill, and it was also the time of some disturbances, and we all lived through... Um, the difficult times after the assassination of Martin Luther King. And I'll never forget worrying about them downtown, downtown Washington. Of course, very soon after, uh, they moved to far away Baltimore and we regretted it very much. Uh, we kept uh, in touch, of course, and especially for Dan, was very important to keep, to, to keep track of activities, of Paul's activities, scientific activities, and for us all to see the children grow, both ours and theirs. And there was a special bond that Dan and Paul shared. It was classical music. They would attend concerts and later share records. Those first, as, the, as the, they were very young, those that were 78s, and the long playing ones, long playing variety, followed by CDs. They were not just collecting, they listened intently, discussed and compared performances. They shared thoughts and reveled in the sound of music. Once Dan passed away, I truly missed those discussions. And now that Paul is gone, I try to listen to music and I find comfort in that memory. May we all remember Paul for all the joy he brought us. Oh, I got a slide. Can you hear? I'm Edie Stern, no relation to Alan Stern, relation to Alan Spradling. Um, I'm accurately described in the program as Paul's longtime partner in musical crime. I thank Paul's family for inviting me to tell you about his musical life. And I particularly thank Florence for catching me up on his early years before any of us knew him. <laughs> 
Fine said that their family wasn't particularly musical, but their parents listened to WQXR, the classical music station in New York City. Thanks. Paul must have listened to, and especially carefully, on Saturday afternoon during the Metropolitan Opera broadcasts, because he sure got hooked early. Florence made clear from the start that Paul's tastes were both eclectic and sophisticated. As she said, he admired Richard Wagner's ring cycle. He introduced Florence to Leonard Bernstein's musical Candide and to Florence and Swan's musical humor. All that and a pilgrimage to the Bayreuth Wagner Festival by age 22. But Paul wasn't just a classical music nerd. He and Florence knew all the hit Broadway tunes and on Saturday mornings before the opera, the teenage Paul listened to the top 40 tune list and he kept a chart of how the songs rose and fell in popularity. Paul started playing violin around sixth grade. That wonderful picture that we saw at the beginning was of him holding the violin very strangely at, when he was just starting out. He didn't switch to the cello remarkably until he was in graduate school. Then he somehow made time during those quick four years to take classes at the Turtle Bay Music School in Manhattan. With such a late start, it's remarkable that he got as good as he did. He must have practiced a great deal in those days. Later on, not so much. It was while he was hosting the classical music program and WKCR at Columbia that he developed his exhaustive knowledge of composers, performers, repertoire, opus and Kirchhoff numbers, even key signatures. He was a walking musical encyclopedia. I think someone else described him as a scientific encyclopedia. Versatile. Fast forward to the spring of 1975. This is one of Joan's favorite stories. Joan, Paul, nine-year-old Kathy, and six-year-old Marion were living in the Park Avenue house in Baltimore. On Saturday mornings, Paul took the girls to a music class at the Peabody Institute. Once while he was waiting for the class to end, he checked out the community bulletin board and he saw a note that read, mediocre violist looking for chamber group. He called. I assured him that I was a truly lousy violist. And sight unseen, we agreed that each of us would find a violinist and try playing string quartets. And it worked. We played most Wednesday nights for the next 25 years, plus New Year's Eves. Our only break was the sabbatical year that the Feldman spent in Paris. It's a tough year for those who were left behind not for those who went. <laughs> for most of those 25 years, the two violinists we recruited were a real musician, Adele Cruze, and a UMBC, UMBC math professor to remain unnamed who could not count to four. We welcomed other musicians whenever they were available. Paul recruited accomplished physics and astronomy musical colleagues, pianist Chaling Chen and the devoted Brian Judd, and the eager violinist, Julian Krolik. Dan Reich joined us on bassoon to play the double bass part in the trap quintet. Adele brought in her neighbors. I brought people I'd met on the Hopkins shuttle bus. And with each new musician, we could expand our repertoire to piano quartets, quintets, and sextets. On one grand occasion, we doubled in size and were able to play the Mendelssohn octet. We met at each other's homes if they had enough soundproofing to spare the neighbors. So here was the ritual. We played for two and a half hours, usually alternating between old and new pieces. Then Paul would groan, what a workout. Then we ate dessert. This was often a chocolate cake to feed Paul's habit. Whatever the dessert, he washed it down with beer, as you saw. When we played at the Feldman's house in the early years, Kathy and Marion were <laughs> under strict instructions never to interrupt us. One evening while we were mid movement, one of the girls answered the phone, but she knew not to bother dad. Later, Paul asked who had called, the Blythe reply, oh, that was just the fact checker from the New York Times. <laughs> Paul's musical taste stayed eclectic and sophisticated all his life. The list of composers we played sounds like a pre-woke classical radio show. Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Mendelssohn, Schubert, Schumann, 
Brahms, Dvorak, Broidian, Debussy, Ravel, Foray, Bartok, Shostakovich, Prokofiev, Ives, Barber. And being an opera fan, Paul also brought us quartets by opera composers Verdi, Puccini, and Gershwin. He provided the sheet music from his prodigious collection. Wherever he traveled around the world, he'd visit music shops and look for new works to bring back to us. As you have heard, his favorite opera composer was Verdi and his favorite opera in the world was Verdi's Don Carlos. He and Joan attended the Baltimore, Baltimore Opera while it lasted. They regularly went to New York for Metropolitan Opera performances and they would fly as far as Europe for a weekend just to hear an opera, especially if it was Don Carlos. Paul was operatic, but not a prima donna. Joan said that he was never pretentious, he never looked down on anyone, and he never lost his temper. All this was certainly true in the quartet. He never lorded his extensive musical knowledge over the rest of us, he never criticized, he never blew his own horn, as it were. Once in a while, he'd mentioned going to a rocket launch, but he never told us about it when the asteroid was named for him. We would have been so proud to have known that. A case of Paul's virtues in action. We gave one of our rare public performances during a very hot July when Mayor William Donald Schaefer was running for reelection. My neighbors had arranged to host a reception for his campaign and they invited us to play background music in the parlor. A week beforehand, we rehearsed at their house to get a feel for the acoustics and the heat. One of the family's young sons became too curious about Paul's cello. The kid accidentally knocked it over and broke off the whole neck. Mafalda, would you be willing to show us what the whole neck is? <laughs> he bisected it. Thank you. Paul handled this crisis with his customary equanimity. He didn't break the kid's neck. He didn't break my neck. He let me take the shards to the local violin technician and beg him for a quick repair. The technician must have been a Democrat because he fixed the cello in time and we were able to play the gig. But one of the pieces on our program was Mozart's Dissonance Quartet. It got that nickname because it opens with a discordant grating introduction before the start of the sprightly Mozartian first melody. At the end of the evening, Somebody came up to us and asked very innocently, which piece that you played was the dissonance? Because apparently everything we played sounded great. <laughs> In spite of us, Mayor Schaefer won re-election. Paul did not have the greatest technique, but he was a born chamber musician. He was an excellent sight reader and counter who rarely lost his place. He played with zeal, he had rhythm. He understood and brought out the structure of the pieces as he played them. He was sensitive to the other musicians. As intently as he played, it was relaxing for him. If something bothered him, we never knew it. One of the things I appreciated most about his playing was that no matter how badly we bungled a passage, he didn't hear our train wreck. He heard the notes the way the composer had intended them. He was always up for another try to get it right. If you had any doubts about Paul's commitment to music, for many years, he drove a Honda Prelude. The quartet stopped meeting regularly in the late 1990s because of illnesses, but we all stayed friends for the rest of our lives. My thanks to Paul, Joan, Kathy, Marion, for your open-hearted friendship for the past half century. You adopted me as an extra and well-fed member of the family. In recent years, my Ellen and I looked for Joan and Paul at Shriver Hall concerts, and we enjoyed comparing notes on the performances, especially if it was a piece we'd played together and we considered ourselves big experts on. Being able to share so many masterpieces with Paul and so much wonderful time with all of you has been one of the great experiences of my life. During Paul's last months, Marion asked him who were his favorite composers. By then he had come back to the three Bs, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. Joan chose three movements from Bach's cello suites for the, our music today. We thank Mafalda Santos for playing them so beautifully. Paul would have loved hearing you. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, uh, Ethan, you want to come up and talk about dinners and travels, whatever. So um, I met Paul some 40 years ago, I think, although it may have taken uh, close to a decade till I got to know him well. In fact, our paths started a very similar route, then diverged and then came back. Uh, I also was uh, born in New York out of, uh, with, from uh, Ukrainian emigres, or one. Um, I also went to high school. I went to Bronx Science as opposed to Brooklyn Tech. I also started college at the age of 16 in engineering and rapidly switched to physics and ended up in astronomy. Um, I came to Baltimore in 1981 when the Space Science Institute was uh, established at Hopkins and I was asked to lead the uh, Hubble operations. In fact, uh, the word uh, Cambridgeitis was mentioned before. After college, I went to graduate school in, in Cambridge at MIT and never left until 81. <laughs> So that, that sort of gave me the divergence. Uh, given the hectic nature of the early years of, uh, of Hubble here in Baltimore, um, and the fact that Paul, Paul's fields and, my, and we were in very different areas of astronomy. He did uh, UV cometary research. I did extra, extra galactic X-ray astronomy. Uh, so our paths didn't overlap that much at the beginning. However, by 1985, I had moved to Bolton Hill. Uh, my, my family, diagonally across the street from Joan and Paul and family. Baltimore being the small town it is, we certainly got to know each other. By the early 90s, we started seeing each other more regularly, helped by the fact that my wife got to know uh, Joan, Kathy helped with babysitting and recommended babysitting, uh, cat sitting, I'm sorry, <laughs> babies and cats. Um, uh, Paul, and I, Paul and I both traveled a lot and uh, especially overseas. And we found ourselves going to many of the same places that our shared profession took us, uh, not just astronomy meetings, but visits to colleagues in interesting places. In addition, my wife, Janet, and Joan uh, were both interested in art. Joan often had gave us advice to where we had to go, to what we had to see in places we were going to. Um, uh, it's... Uh, very useful when you're traveling to France and Italy, Japan. Um, uh, importantly, Paul and I both loved food. We started, ended up sharing eating experiences and often meals in Florence and Paris and Kyoto, Rome. When one of us went on a trip, we often would report back to the other and what we had found. Rest, places to stay, places to eat, in, new and interesting foods, not to mention wine. Uh, we were both very fond of wine and a good thing given the amount of time we were spending in France and Italy. Um, in fact, uh, another food experience is it, many of you may not know. Uh, uh, when we, uh, I got married or remarried in 1993 and we investigated various places to have a party and we ended up at the uh, Peabody Library. And we, we tried every caterer in Baltimore and ended up with Charles Levine. Joan and Paul was there, were there, and Paul ended as the chair of the department, ended up using Charles of the Line for, for uh, uh, astronomy catering here for the next decade or so, because he liked the food so much. Um, ironically, when Paul was recovering from his heart attack in the 90s, we made a dinner for them. It turned out to be, it was Paul's first meal outside his house. And a few years later, in 2002, when I was recovering from a stroke, they reciprocated, and my first meal outside my house was at their house. Um, so food, food did play a, uh, a rather large um, role in our friendship. Um, sometimes we even managed to be at the, together at the same professional meetings. Unusual, but, but definitely uh, many more than once. I can think of Paris, Sardinia, Japan. One particularly memorable uh, experience occurred at the, the International Astronomical Union meeting in Kyoto. I can't remember which year it was, but uh, we had heard of a good uh, restaurant in the hills outside the city. Joan took it upon herself to organize a, a dinner for, I think, six of us with the help of the uh, uh, hotel concierge. The instructions were to take a train to a particular stop in the country, then to call the restaurant from the station and say, Feldman, 
the magical word Feld Feldman. Uh, that was the extent of the communication. We did that. Indeed, uh, shortly after we did that, a car pulled up, the driver inquired Feldman, and the six of us got in, and we ended up having a magnificent meal um, seated on a platform above a, a rushing mountain stream, being served fantastic dinner, many dishes of which we didn't know, but it didn't matter. Um, Paul and I both had colleagues in, in Florence and Paris and Rome, among other places. We shared insights on places to stay, often friends' apartments, certainly made visits much more informal and, and in welcoming. In fact, we ended up probably staying at different times in the same places. Um, Paul and I never did formally collaborate in astronomy. Um, we worked in different fields, but Hubble certainly became an important tool in Paul's research and Paul helped guide the science program of, of Hubble. In closing, I think that uh, my relationship and, and friendship with Paul had less to do with our astronomy careers, and much more with our shared enjoyment of life, of you know, the music, the travel, art, especially food and wine. It's hard to believe he's gone, but I certainly, uh, certainly value our shared time together and his, his family. Thank you. Okay, well, my father clearly was a giant, and I'm sure everyone is uh, giantly full of him and ready for some real sustenance. So, um, so after the postlude, we will adjourn to the area outside of the auditorium for brunch. Um, I can't thank you all enough for joining us. Um, also, the folks who joined via Zoom, it's just been so tremendously fabulous to have the support and love um, over these past months and, and today. So on behalf of my mom, Joan, and the rest of the family, I'd like to thank all of today's speakers for their heartfelt tributes to and memories of my father. I'd really like to thank Edie for helping us um, develop this fabulous musical program and to Mafaldo Santos for the incredible uh, cello music. Steve McCandless and Hal Weaver were indispensable to developing the program, um, lining up speakers, creating the deck, and, and clearly running the show today. And then most especially, we'd like to thank Pam Carmen and Norma Berry for everything they've done to make today possible. Um, as well as everything they did for dad over the years. So without further ado, Mafalda, thank you so much.